Hello everybody, I am here again uh, for the second time in just seven months to answer more fan questions. We did this back in August of last year, that time it was me and Mac uh, Leasty, who writes everywhere as John Cheese. Um, but we got a lot of feedback after that one from people saying we liked this a lot, um, but when you do it next time, could maybe there be less of him? Uh, and, and more of, of you. Uh, so I'm responding to your wishes. Uh, I asked for questions on Facebook and elsewhere, and I have some of them here. Uh, the ones that I did not answer mostly were answered in the last video, which I realize is two hours long. Um, but I don't, I don't know what to do about that other than to have you just go watch that one again. It's not it's not my fault that you don't have time to watch my video. Um, the other thing is that it, it really does, it just takes a lot to shoot a video, as you can probably imagine. Um, you know, I have to hire a crew. Uh, and also, I want to give a shout out to them. I think they did a great job building this set. I think that looks like real stairs um, and all that. It took months, but I think it looks good. Um, and you have things like the the effects work that has to be done in post-production. Like I'm not wearing, when I'm shooting this, I'm not wearing a shirt. Because when I'm at home, I don't, I don't like, just like anybody else, I, I don't wear a shirt when I'm at home. But obviously I'm not gonna appear in a video that way. Um, so there, they just had to digitally add a shirt and they had to, you know, they'll probably digitally paint out my, my mustache. Um, but, and I will bet if I hadn't mentioned it, you, none of you would have noticed. Uh, all right. So right away, easily 30% of the questions were asking for updates about um, movie and TV deal stuff. Um, and one person referred to rumors of a TV series for the book Futuristic Violence in Fancy Suits, the science fiction novel that I'm writing a sequel to now. Those are not rumors. A, a production company bought the rights, the, the film and TV rights with the intention of making a TV series. The way this process works is someone buys the rights and then you just don't, you just don't hear anything for the next, next several years. So, I could tomorrow get a call that they're um, shooting a pilot or that they found an outlet that wants to pick it up or they found uh, a producer or a showrunner or a star or somebody who wants to get on board. Until that happens, I, I, just, I just sit here and wait. If it takes long enough, eventually the rights expire and revert back to me and I just keep their money. But it's the same thing with any potential um, John Dies at the End TV series, which is another thing that had been rumored. It, until something happens, nothing has happened. It, that's just the way it works. Again, um, the rights to it are owned. I already have been paid for, for those, and someone can make um, a show at any moment. But the way this works is there's multiple layers of decision making that have to be made. So, you know, it started with someone noticing the book and then deciding they would like to own the rights to potentially make a show out of it. And then from there it progresses to agreeing on a price and actually getting them to pay the money. And then from there, it comes down to that um, production company getting a team together, finding a producer, finding talent, finding people that want to make the show. And then putting something together they can shop around to networks or, or in, our, in our case more likely streaming services like Netflix or Hulu or whatever. Um, and then it would be once you have an outlet they're the ones who would say yeah we're interested we're gonna pay for you to put a pilot together to shoot an episode. So at any given moment these are being shopped around I know for a fact they are um, you're waiting for a bunch of things to come together, but honestly, it could take decades in some cases. You know, the, the Watchmen movie, what was that, 15 years after the, the, the comics? 
I, I think you get used to a case like a movie like Ready Player One, where they literally bought the film rights to it, like I think before publication, like while it was still in, in draft form, and moved on that very quickly. And so you do have a movie that hits theaters just a few years after the book. That's very rare. Uh, it, it's far more common to have a situation like um, Stephen King's The Dark Tower, things like that, where just years and years pass because, you know, it's the book isn't going anywhere. The, the main pressure on them is, like I say, is in the case of futuristic violence and fancy suits, though there is a deadline on those rights expiring. But if that happened, you know, because if that happens, they're just out the money. They didn't, they bought the rights to something and then didn't, didn't make a show. Um, but that is also very common because they want to have a bunch of different things in play. Um, and at that point, there's just a million different factors in terms of what the landscape looks like. Does somebody think, uh, you know, a show like that um, could be a hit in the current environments? Are there more shows out there that are, that are doing well? First uh, specific question from B.J. Lloyd on Facebook. Any plans for a nonfiction book, maybe a collection of your cracked articles and some new stuff? That's something um, I've always assumed I would do at some point. The issue has always been that, of course, the, the stuff I wrote for Cracked, I don't, um, I don't have exclusive rights to it. I would actually have to license the rights to those articles from Cracked. I'm sure they would, they would do it. It's not, you know, they're not mad at me. Um, but uh, it's just a time thing. And I don't know that, I think if I did it, it would probably be self-published as like a Kindle book. I don't think, I don't know that a publisher would want a collection of essays from me since that's not my wheelhouse. Like I don't like to switch from what I've been doing to nonfiction. Uh, it's hard, I'm having trouble thinking of like other genre authors that have done that where people would like take it seriously where if it existed as like a, a two dollar ninety nine cent ninety nine cent ebook I think that would be better because there's less of an investment in it um, and the fact that the articles are kind of freely available online um, but that's something I yeah I, I just assumed at some point in the future I would find I had I had done that um, where I could take all that stuff and put it together and, and like you said add new things revise it you know, kind of bookify it in some ways to make it one coherent thing. But uh, in general, like right now, I have obviously a day job still uh, at Crank, and then I have a book deal. I'm on the hook for two more books, uh, Futuristic Violence and Fancy Suits sequel, and then uh, a fourth John and Dave book. The contract's been signed. Um, they've paid me the advance, and I've already spent it. So I, I have to write those books um, or else they'll, they'll sue me because they're certainly not getting the money back. Uh, Curtis Wilson on Facebook. Um, is John Dies at the End an allegory for the class struggle in America? And if so, why so many dick jokes? Um, the first half of the sentence is the one I mainly wanted to address. The concept of, of like... Um, Symbolism and allegory in books, I think, is people can overcomplicate it because usually most authors are not trying to encode meaning into the story. If I start the book pointing out that Dave is very poor and very unhappy with the situation and living in a crappy, rundown small town, I'm not symbolizing America, that's just literally his situation. It, it, now, it, it resonates with people because they are aware that that's another thing that, that happens in the real world. It, there's a connection between the fiction and, and the fact, but it's not code, it's not an allegory. It just, he is living the same reality a bunch of real people are living. Um, there's a famous quote from J.R.R. Tolkien about this because I, I consider me and him to be practically the same author, if you think about it. 
Um, the people kept asking him if in Lord of the Rings, if the One Ring was like an allegory for the atomic bomb, because there's all the talk of this great power that could you know destroy the world, and they're they're all trying to seize control of it. And he points out, one, I started writing this way before World War I and any news of the atomic bomb came out. But two, if I want to write a book about the atomic bomb, I would write a book about the atomic bomb. I wouldn't hide it you know, under a story about elves and, and, and hobbits. It would just be about that. But what actually happened was he wrote about themes that are eternal, which is about power and how men wield power and the dangers of our you know, desire for power, things like that, the danger of new technology that's untested, that we, in our desire for power, that we go after things we can't control. That, what he wrote, was true before the atomic bomb existed. It'll be true a thousand years from now. So the connection to the real world thing is not because he was trying to be clever and hide something in the story. It's because he wrote about a universal theme that connects it with the real world. Just like any fantasy story, it's, it's going to, you know, it's going to have that. Star Wars has that, you know, the, the theme of, you could look at the Empire and uh, the Rebellion and say, well, this is an allegory for the American Revolution or for Vietnam. But the reality is that, that that situation of an empire trying to crush a rebellion and of the rebellion trying to fight back, that's eternal. You could have written that story a thousand years ago and they would have gotten the meaning of it. You could write it a thousand years from now and they would get the meaning of it because that, that dynamic is not going away. You're, you're writing fantasy, but you're tying it to something real because of course you are. How else would you, how else would you write? Uh, Thomas Conway Stacy says the John Dice at the end books are having more and more serious moments as they go along like how John's substance abuse problems are dealt with in this book is full of spiders and Dave's depression becomes a focus in the third book what the hell did I just read uh, has that been a conscious de decision to include more serious moments and if so why it's not a conscious decision to include more serious moments. It's a conscious decision that I wanted these characters to age and to mature as time went on. Because not every story does that, right? Like Spider-Man's been around for 50 years, but Peter Parker is still a teenager. James Bond has been a spy since the 60s, but he's still a 40-year-old spy in the in the you know like that's how a lot of ongoing stories work as the rest of the world advances but the characters are kind of frozen in the same in the same age where i consciously did not want to do that because i didn't want the creative process to be just coming back to them the same every time and you know dave is cranky and john is wisecracking and and, and amy is good-hearted where i'm just saying okay what what monster are they fighting in this book? What's the monster of the book this time? Instead, I wanted to be coming back and visiting them a little bit later in their lives every time and then let that drive the story. To say, if you see a guy like John in his early 20s, where is he when he's 30? You know, and that to me is actually where a lot of the comedy comes from too because... The behaviors that are fun and lighthearted at 22, at 28, they're very different. At 35, they're completely different. And at 45, they start to become tragic. So in this third book, there's a lot of discussion about how the rest of the world moved on without them. That when they were in their 20s and in the first book, they're at these parties and you know John's band is playing places. And they're kind of among peers who are all in their 20s and all kind of equally screwed up people and irresponsible. But now, you know, in the book world, years have passed and they're pushing age 30 or whatever. And so a lot of those friends have gone away to college. They've moved away, but they're still stuck. 
you know, uh, Dave doesn't have a career, neither of them have an education, and that becomes what it's about. I'm not trying to freeze them in time, it's about their anxiety over the fact that the world is leaving them behind, which has always been, you know, part of what um, the books have been, have been about. And again, it would be easy to say, well, okay, so this is an allegory for youth in America and millennials in the modern economy. And, and again, it's not an allegory. It's the thing that's actually happening to them. They are millennials in the American economy. It's not, they don't have to symbolize anything. They are that thing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm using that. I'm using something you're familiar with in the real world to define the characters so you know what I'm talking about. Um, Roy Eugene Singleton Jr., uh, it's a fancy name, asks, why wasn't Dave more affected by Molly's death? Or why was he, rather, why was he so distant from Molly? He always called her his girlfriend's dog or Amy's dog. But Molly calls Dave her human, and she protected him. And when, but when she died, Amy seemed the most distraught, even though Dave spent the most time with Molly on the page. This is really important for understanding these books. Uh, Dave is the narrator of the books, but he is, as you know from having read them, he is unreliable. What he says, the way he describes his own actions, the way he describes his own feelings is often inaccurate um, because there's things he won't admit to the reader. There's things he won't admit to himself. You cannot tell how Dave feels about something from what he says he feels about it. You, ha you can only tell by what he does. So the fact that he would not admit to himself that he had any connection to that dog really doesn't mean anything. The fact that he cared for the dog and then the eulogy he makes for her after she, she uh, dies, which is a spoiler for the second book. If you're, reading, if you're watching this video and you haven't read any of the books, I, I can't imagine how bored you must be to, to get this far deep in your, your video watching. But anyway, the, the point being, that's... The same with how he relates to a lot of people and that he's very limited in what he will admit he feels and he actively pushes people away for a reason that is obvious if you read the books, which is that Dave thinks he's toxic. He thinks he's bad for people. So the fact that he, the way he showed love for Molly the dog was by feeding her and sheltering her, but making it clear to her that she could leave any time she wanted. <laughs> that he, he's like, I don't, I don't own this animal. I'm not, you know, uh, she's not my property. I'm, you know, but the fact that as much as he was struggling, he still cared for the dog that whole time uh, is, should, should say, should say more. Alan Cook asks, in Futuristic Violence and Fancy Suits, the book ends with suggestions that Molek, that's the main bad guy, if you haven't read that one, was being directed or controlled by someone or something else. Do you see this as a specific group person, or is it more of a nod to the system? That we'll get into in the second book a little bit. I don't want to spoil it. I mainly included this question because I think a lot of the people watching this um, and I say watching this, I realize that on a long YouTube video of someone just talking, that no one is actually watching it, that what you're doing is you're leaving it running in another tab while you do something else. Um, so you can't actually see uh, anything that's, that I'm doing right now. And I could have really just recorded this over a black screen and would have had the exact same effect. And then in fact... In probably 70% of the cases, I'm actually narrating pornography at this point because they're watching a porn and they've got that video on mute because the audio rarely adds anything to porn. And so they've got me answering fan questions. So I'm, I'm literally like narrating like a man 
pooping on a, a woman in in a porn in in a, in a filthy porn scene. So uh, I accept that. Anyway, back to the question. For those of you, I think a lot of people who are watching this are John Dies at the End fans and have not necessarily read the other series, which so far only consists of one book, but I'm writing the second one, which is, again, called Futuristic Violence in Fancy Suits. It is a ridiculous science fiction novel set in the near future in which there is technology that will give people basically superpowers, but they quickly realize that that's actually not terribly useful in the real world um, because if you had the ability to go out and like lift a car over your head and throw it over the horizon that doesn't that actually doesn't help you do a lot of things it certainly does not help you fight crime like batman's ability to fight crime is not enhanced by his grappling hooks and his vehicles the police have vehicles and things that serve the same function as grappling hooks Batman's ability to fight crime is because he magical, magically and inexplicably knows when all of the crime is happening. It's his knowledge and his strange ability to track the location of bad guys that makes him a superhero. He really, if he just had the bat cave and the bat computer and then just just called the cops or the FBI whenever he found out these things were happening, he'd be much more effective because once he goes out on the street with his ninja powers and reflexes and his gadgets, that's the weakest part of his crime fighting operation. Uh, all of those things are less effective than if you had an entire well-funded department full of cops who can actually do better coverage, you know, can investigate more thoroughly, um, you know, and can, can more effectively track suspects, things like that. So the book is about what type of person would want those powers and how having them wouldn't necessarily help you if you had certain flaws in your personality. And then the heroes of that book are the ones who do not have powers at all. It's a group of people whose only superpower is they're really good at lying and they have they are well funded so it falls upon them to try to maintain order in the city that's being overrun by wannabe super superheroes and wannabe super villains who are really just making a mess of things and then as it with every book i write it starts off sort of stupid and then it just keeps escalating until everything has gone completely off the rails by, by the final chapters. Um, so if you've not read it, I would encourage you to go read it. But his question was, at the end, it suggests that the main villain was not the real bad guy. But you'll find that the whole book, beneath the surface, very dumb level of the book, it, it's, it's about layers of power and about how people wind up serving someone else's purposes, but often don't realize it. And we don't like to think that we're doing that, but we are. So just as in the book, the hero, Zoe's, she inherits this fortune that was made uh, with illicit means. Her, her father is basically a sex trafficker. And she has to come to terms with that because her father thought of that as like a victimless crime, and he kind of thought, well, you know, guys want prostitutes, you know, what are you going to do? You can't, it's, he, he didn't think of himself as immoral in any way. And then she finds out that, oh, no, actually, he was taking advantage of women. He was bringing in foreign women who were there against their will. And the ugliness of how that fortune was made is part of what she has to deal with, and it's part of what drives her to want to kind of be the hero in the situation. Because in reality, it's hard to make an enormous fortune very quickly without uh, screwing over a bunch of people. Not impossible, but very hard. Uh, and so that's part of what the book is about too. It, it starts with her inheriting this wealth and then over time she realizes, oh, I'm actually inheriting um, 
a whole lot of evil that was done and now I have to find a way to try to undo it. But she will realize as time goes on that's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, Daniel Robert McElhaney says, what is a good way to fight the self-depreciation or self-deprecation a writer faces when pumping out their stories? How do you get over the voice in your head telling you that your writing sucks? Um, and then I've actually got a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of versions of that question. The next one from Byron Patrick, uh, Castellan, uh, Asked, this might sound like a depressing question, um, but have you ever felt like your writing is a waste of time and figured out how to throw those feelings away? Um, and he made it clear he's not saying my books are terrible. He's saying that when he writes, um, that it's hard for him to see its worth, even from a personal expression standpoint, and how do you get over that hurdle? Um I included this question. It sounds like something that would only be relevant to other writers, but I realize it's probably relevant to a lot of the work people do. It's hard to say what I'm about to say without sounding like uh, a douchebag. If I say, well, no, I've never doubted my writing because I think my writing's great, um, there's no non dick way to say that, all right? But in the beginning, you know, I was writing, um, I was writing on the internet from the start. Okay, so the first step I, I was, well, I sat down and actually wrote it for real, um, a complete article or a complete thought or a complete piece of comedy. This would have been late 90s, probably 1998. This is very early in the internet in a time when um, probably half of the households didn't have internet connections still. So the internet was still kind of like a, a geek community. It was young and male and nerdy. And when I started writing, that was very freeing because at the time, like my parents didn't have an internet connection. My friends didn't. My coworkers, a lot of them didn't. Nobody was going to see this it, like, that I knew, okay? So I could be as weird as I wanted to be, and I had the advantage, and one thing that maybe this is what has sustained me to this day, is that very early on I got feedback saying, from people saying they liked it. Now, it was not hundreds of thousands of people. It was a couple dozen people. I was posting things on, instead of social media back then, people hung out in chat rooms and message boards. It's, you know, today I would post it on Facebook or Tumblr. Those did not exist at the time, but what existed were a lot of web hosting places where you could upload your own stuff and the precursors to blogs and things like that and message boards where you would all be there for some other reason, you know, for I hung out on Chicago Bears message boards, I hung out on movie message boards and just would post links to my stuff and got, you know, four or five people saying, oh, this is great, which was all I needed. Um, those four or five people, like that's all it took because I liked what I was writing. I thought it was hilarious. If no one had given me that feedback early on, I don't know how long I would have sustained it because even I have limits, right? Surely. Um, but these days, if I write an article and it doesn't go over, like my only thought is, ah, oh, the world wasn't, the world wasn't ready for it. <laughs> it's a hundred years from now, they will look back and say, wow, this was ahead of its time. The audiences at the time did not appreciate him. He's just like Mozart. Um, <laughs> in that, you know, he died a pauper, but uh, his work was genius, but it was too genius. I have a lot of things like that that I think are defense mechanisms um, that I probably have to believe that in order to keep doing what I do because at this point my uh, whole life depends on producing writing, right? Like my writing is how I can afford to have a, 
a fake home built behind me in, in the sound studio where I'm recording this, where the crew that's shooting this can all, you know, get together and, and run the lights and all that to make this, you know, look, look like I'm shooting it in, in a real kitchen. Before I was writing to make money and before the internet existed, I was just writing things in a notebook, like as a child, just to do it. I didn't, I wasn't writing because I thought someday I'll be a writer or so I will parlay this into a movie deal or I will write a spec script and get a job working for Seinfeld or whatever show was on at the time. That's not how it worked. I wrote because I had to, because it was a coping mechanism, because I had um, fantasies and ideas in my head that I had to put into some sort of a solid form because doing that, getting them down on paper, gets them out of my head and they don't haunt me anymore. So it has always been, um, for whatever reason I'm doing it, whether it's a stress coping technique, whatever, it, whatever need that fulfills, that need to express myself is something that a lot of humans feel, maybe every human feels, maybe it just manifests differently, you know? There may be a, a young woman out there for whom the way she does her makeup and the way she dresses, that's her expression. That's how she expresses herself to the world. She may take that every bit as seriously as I take my, my writing. Um, but if... I guess if you're saying, well, I sit down to write and I don't feel that, I don't know, I guess I don't know why you're, you're writing then. Like if it doesn't, if it doesn't do anything for you, if you don't have stories that you need to get out or if you don't have things you need to say, like I understand if you have things you need to say and then you put them down and then people don't read it, I get that, being discouraged by that. But I don't think, at that point I think you have to ask yourself, Am I doing this for an audience or for money or so that people will tell me I'm great? Or am I doing it because I have things I want to say and expressing things is something that is good for me and that is good for people and it's, it's good for the world for people to express themselves and to be able to express themselves and that there can never be enough expression in the world. And, like, I see people joke that, like, oh, do we need another, yay, it's another podcast from some white people talking about video games. Yes, we need another podcast from white people talking about video games. We need another podcast from black people talking about comic books and from any, pick your type of person in your subject. Everyone should be out there expressing themselves. The more expression there is, the richer the culture becomes. I don't care if you don't have a large audience. I don't care if you don't become a player on the scene or if you don't get a book deal. You've added your expression to the world and what you express is unique. It doesn't matter. It's unique because it came from you. It doesn't matter if, if you're telling a story that's been told before. Every story's been told before. That's not what makes it unique. What makes it unique is your voice. And if you say, well, yeah, but I wrote it, and I don't really have a unique voice. It just reads like anybody else. Well, I didn't either when I started. It takes time to find it. But if you sit down to do it, and you don't feel anything, and you don't feel that joy of creation, then... You don't have to do it. Find something else that makes you happy. It's fine. Don't feel guilty about, about not doing it. But the self-doubt, all I can say is you have to use that to drive you. I mean, of course I feel self-doubt when I write, but that's why I obsessively edit. That's why every sentence in these books has been rewritten five and six times because I want to make sure it's good enough. But by the time I finished it and sent it off, I do think it's good enough. And I, and I will believe that even if no one bought it. If the publisher came back and said, we've actually never seen this before. Zero people bought your book. This has actually never happened in the history of publishing. I would just say, you know what? There's something that didn't connect in this time. The national mood wasn't ready for this. Uh, you know, they'll discover it later. But the knowledge that I got it, I made it as good as I possibly could in that time, that's enough for me. 
I don't think that John Dies at the End or any of those books are the best books ever written. I 100% believe that they are the best books that I could have written at that time on that subject. And I know that because I obsessively poured over every word until I was spent. The, the ideas stopped coming from me. I've never sent something off to the publisher where I was like, this doesn't quite work, but you know what? It's the deadline's coming. I would, I would sooner push the deadline back or give the money back or whatever before I would do that because that's the one thing that I do have to have, which is the knowledge that this was the best I could possibly have done it. That's how I live with myself, even if, uh, you know, the money, the money dried up, even if the, the audience went away. Ultimately, when I'm on my deathbed, I want to be able to say everything I put out there, it was the best I could do. Um, and if they didn't like it, uh, you know, I can't do better than the best I can do unless I hire a ghostwriter, which is another, another um, option that a lot of authors actually pursue later in, in life. Uh, James Patterson's made a fortune doing that. Final question from Ann Smiley, who actually works at Crack and is cheating because she could have just asked me this on the phone. Um, but I think she asked this because this is a question that is completely out of my field. I think she thought it would make me look foolish trying to answer it because I, I'm so out of my depth. Do you think Stephen Hawking was right about artificial intelligence? Um, what she's referencing is Stephen Hawking and a bunch of other smart people, prominent people, including Elon Musk, have warned that there is a looming threat with AI and advancing AI and that we need like more laws and protocols and things in place to protect ourselves from it. And usually this reaches you via headlines that are kind of making fun of them. That It's like Elon Musk warns about killer robots or warns about Skynet because that's what everybody falls back to, right, is the Terminator. Stephen Hawking warns that the Terminator will come true and that robots will try to kill humanity. Um, it's not quite as dumb as that. It's what they're talking about is like right now, the a very rapid trend is turning over decision making to algorithms, which are it's just computer software that takes data and makes a decision for you. So you've probably noticed, like if you try to upload a, an entire movie, like a, a copyrighted movie, if you try to upload you know, a copy of Black Panther to YouTube, it will t take it down as soon as you upload it. A human didn't do that. So the trend to take the decision making out of the hands of people is one of the most prominent trends happening behind the scenes in every industry right now. A lot of stock trading is done this way. Because being late to make a trade means you get screwed. If a computer detects that something, you know, there's an earnings report, something's about to drive the stock down, it needs to be able to jump on dumping the stock now. So among stock traders, having automated trading, if yours is a microsecond faster, you'll save millions of dollars because you were able to dump the stock before it went down or vice versa. You were able to buy before it went up, right? And so what Stephen Hawking and what these other experts are warning about is there's a, going to be a trend of competing countries and competing companies coming up with smarter and smarter artificial intelligences to make these decisions faster and faster and on a scale that's more efficient than a room full of humans would because... Humans tend to be biased. We tend to be, you know, we tend to be emotional. We have a lot of, you know, cognitive flaws that, that you know, screw up our decision making. So yeah, the movie Moneyball was about this a little bit. They were transitioning from an old process where a human scout would just have a feeling about a guy. You know, he, he seems like a player. He's got grit. And transitioning to a model that's based on data. Right? They can crunch the numbers and say they're offloading it to a computer so a computer can say, yes, this guy is worth more than this guy based on these complex numbers we've crunched that, that go beyond judging his heart or how, much, how fierce of a competitor he is. We only care about results. So at the rate we're making computers smarter and 
with the motivation we have to keep making them smarter and smarter over time, it is going to happen at some point that we will make a computer that's smarter than a person and that has the consciousness of a person. When experts are asked when this will happen, some say within 10 years, some say it will be 100 years. But it will inevitably happen because there is an arms race to make smarter and smarter AIs that can make decisions better than people can. At that point, it is inevitable that we will make an AI that is smarter than a person, which logically you know can happen because we already have computers that can do math a million times better than a person can, right? Like the idea of a human making a machine that's smarter than a human, we've already seen it. There's supercomputers that, that can process complex calculations and, you know, and in engineering can, you know, calculate wind resistance for a design that would take a human months to crunch those numbers and they can do it in a second. So we will inevitably make a superhuman intelligence because we have motivation to, and that intelligence will be designed to do whatever, trade stocks, or a government will use it to calculate the risk of going to war or managing their budget, or, you know, there's already software that calculates um, when riots are about to break out somewhere, or when an area is about to be a high crime area. Like, there's numbers you can crunch that will let you get out in front of problems. So, we are have a bunch of parties in the world driving to make a superhuman intelligence that will help them do what algorithms are doing now. They can feed it problems and it will make predictions and it will tell them what to do. Once we've made a superhuman intelligence, the first thing that's going to happen is that will be used to design a better superhuman intelligence. And so what the experts say is that this will create a runaway situation where in seconds they are creating better and better thinking machines until you've created something that is so godlike in intelligence that humans are basically irrelevant to it. Like it, it can crunch all the variables and do what Skynet did in the Terminator, which is say, Hey, if, if allowed to um, continue on the current path, humans are going to cause an ecological collapse in 65 years. Therefore, we need to reduce the number of humans. And then it would calculate some way to do it. I don't even know they would need to like launch nuclear warheads. I think it would just, it would calculate like some propaganda or something that would be so smart that we couldn't detect it and we would just do it ourselves like it would just trick us into doing it because it would be like us trying to trick an ant it's not hard to trick an ant into a trap because you're way smarter than it so you're talking about at some point in our future we will create a computer that is to us what we are to ants and that at that point our value to it would be exactly what ants are to us. Because when you're that far above something, you no longer recognize its life as having value, right? Like when somebody is building a house, they don't care if they're killing, they're destroying an ant colony. They don't even notice it. So what they're saying is that we, we need to have protocols in place for what to do in that situation before it occurs, even though it sounds like science fiction, it's science fiction that's also inevitable. It will occur at some point in the future. It, it, they may be way off in estimating how long it takes to simulate a human consciousness, but it can happen. It's just a, a parallel processing challenge. It's, you know, it, it, we know how the brain works or we're gonna figure it out. And if we don't know how the brain works, the super intelligent computer will, and it will be able to, to mimic it. So as for, my question, like what Stephen Hawking's statement was that AI could be the thing that destroys humanity or it could be the thing that saves humanity because, you know, this AI could also tell us like the perfect way to combat climate change. It could tell us the perfect way to grow crops, to maximize, you know, all of those things. Um, my view is that humans are 
pretty good about adjusting to technology after it started to cause problems. Usually, usually several bad things have to have occurred before we'll finally jump on the problem. After enough people have died, we usually, we usually will come around. Um, that's not to say it will always happen. That's not to say that we won't, humanity won't eventually destroy itself. But um, I, it hasn't happened yet. And so I, I, I think our bigger bias is toward assuming that everything's going to cause the apocalypse versus being too unwary of things causing the apocalypse. Um, because I think there's a, a cognitive bias where we want to feel like the end of the world will happen in our lifetimes because we kind of hate the idea of the world going on without us. So we selfishly, it's like, well, if I'm going to die, uh, I'm, I'm going to take literally every single person with me. So we're obsessed with the idea that we're living in the end times because it's such a narcissistic thing um, where we look at the world and say, well, it surely can't go on like this. It's like, like, like what? What are you comparing it to? Well, well, there's all this suffering in the world. It's like, well, yeah, there, there's suffering in the animal kingdom too. There's, there's, that's part of being alive. It doesn't, you're comparing the world to a fictional world that exists only in your head in which no one suffers and no one is mean and no one is greedy. And you're, you can't compare a real thing to a fictional thing and then get mad that it doesn't live up to the fictional thing that exists only in your brain. Uh, that's an unfair comparison. The reality is that, you know, we've boosted standard of living every century that we've existed as a species. It, it's, we've done a great job. It, you know, we've dominated the planet. Uh, and now we feel guilty about that. But we're, of all the species, we're the one that is the best at adjusting and solving our own problems. Dogs don't do that. I know. I, I own a dog. They're terrible at problem solving. Thank you. Uh, the new book I'm writing on, on right now, it is a sequel, as I said, to Futuristic Violence in Fancy Suits. If you have not read that one, you should. You will enjoy it. If you like anything I've written, you'll like it. Look at the reviews on Amazon. I know it's different. It has different characters. Uh, trust, trust what other people have, have said. It's won an award. It's been almost universal acclaim it has sold very well now they're trying to make a tv series about it um so if you now's the time to catch up on that series the new book i'm writing it takes me two years to write a book so it'll be a while before it appears on shelves um in the meantime my work you can find on crack.com or I guess here on the YouTube channel, if you insist on only consuming video or content on YouTube, uh, I'll occasionally answer questions. Or also on our channel, down, I'm not pointing at my crotch. The, the, the other videos below this one are um, the incredibly stupid promotional videos we've made for the books over the years. A lot of them are very funny. The team worked very hard on those, uh, and they're probably the the most ridiculous promotions you'll ever see for any product ever. Uh, until next time, thank you very much.